teachers really weren't equipped to like understand that everyone learns in different ways. Like I was the kid that would doodle on my on my homework mm. or I would doodle on the tests and like I remember my SATs, instead of filling out those bubbles, mm -hmm. I just did a really cool design with the bubbles. So oh, like wow. I made like this awesome, really intricate pattern with it instead. And I turned that in and the teacher was like, you know, if you wanted to just waste that, like you should have, you should have just let me know before you were going to waste that whole test sheet. And I was like, yeah, but this is history now. So. <laughs> Hi, I'm Courtney Gumbleton, and welcome to the Founders Club podcast, the show where you'll hear the incredible stories of the unapologetically ambitious women founders who are redefining the wild world of entrepreneurship in Texas. Today, we have Choke, who is a self-taught artist whose presence is deeply felt in communities throughout the United States. And she is a nationally recognized artist whose pieces have been sold all over the world. I, we have my friend Choke. Yay. Yay, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for agreeing to come on and be one of my awesome podcast guests. Thanks for having me. I have not done podcasts. Like, <gasps> this is your no, first no, no. one? I think this is my second one. This no, is second this one. is your first one. Yeah. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> well, we are on in a green room. Like this is I awesome. know. Yeah, this we're not playing around. Right it's, it, it's almost like you're on the set of Nickelodeon here. I love this it. Is, we're going to bring out the slime in a little bit. Do you know what I auditioned for Nickelodeon back in no. the day? No. Yeah, for all that. Oh my gosh, I mm -hmm. used to live and breathe that. <laughs> Yep, I auditioned, but I was so shy when they put me in the booth. And they had me read the thing. I was like, I can't, like, I couldn't get it out. Oh my gosh. But I wanted to be on the show so bad. Oh, that would have been so cool. Yeah. yeah. So let's, I always love starting off talking about childhood just because I feel like who you are as a person today, a lot of that is built upon your childhood. Yeah. You know, and yeah. your parents and your environment that you grew up in and the things you loved and all of that. So right. um, I heard that you started creating art as little as five years old. And I was wondering if you were the kind of kid who like would draw all over the walls and then you'd have to clean it up with Clorox oh after God. the fact. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was a problem. I definitely. So I like to say like when people are like, when did you start drawing? When did you start creating? I like to say that I came out with a paintbrush. Like, Ooh, like, I love that. I swear my mom was like, she gave birth with me with crayons in her hand, like in my hands, because I was all about it. I was all about drawing on the walls, drawing on anything I could get my hands on and with, and just always. What was it? What it. was it about that? I mean, did somebody inspire you? And did you see somebody else drawing? Or were you I just, natu just naturally yeah, curious? Yeah, I think I just naturally liked all of the colors and like what they could do and you could you know it's just this natural curiosity powerful. to like see this blank thing turn into this really wildly colorful thing out of nowhere and i've always had these like colors just swimming around in my brain and i'm like oh these kind of swirlies and these circles and you know just making all these designs it's just always been my favorite thing to do you know, and then I discovered that my mom could draw too. Like I didn't know all these years. And then we sat down and she like drew a house plant. And I was like, oh, you have skills. Oh my gosh. Know. We got yeah. it from somewhere. I know it's in there somewhere. Wow. Um, but that's like the journey, right? Like that's the journey of, of why I do what I do. Cause I'm really digging into like, like my ancestry, but then also like, yeah, like my genetics and like where, where in my genetic code was it written that, that like that I was the artistic one and like who gave that to me? Because mm. it's not, it can't just be that like I'm the only one. It, it has to be from somewhere else too. Right. You know, so, you know, in the past somewhere, I know we had other great artists in there. I don't know. With this whole genealogy conversation, right? We can talk about how like you might have these mannerisms about you that you don't even realize that you have. And then, and then maybe like your great grandfather had the same mannerisms. Like that stuff is passed down, and we don't even realize how embedded like our genetics are and how our, you know our lineage is. It's so strong. Yeah, I've always been fascinated with genealogy. 
I mean, even I think when I was a teenager for like Father's Day, I gave each one of my grandfathers one of those books that's uh-huh. like all about you. Oh, cool. For them to fill out and give to me because I wanted to capture those stories yeah. of like, you know, how they met grandma. And, yeah. You know, and one of my favorite things is my grandfather. He's passed now, but he used to tell me about growing up super humble and like eating dandelions in his salad. And then he ended up, you know, owning this multi-million dollar business and retiring at like 45. But the fact that was, he was never too good to eat dandelions in his salad. It was just like one of those things that was just so precious to me. Dandelions are so healthy. You know, I know you get it. And people do not give dandelions credit. That's right. (laughs) Well, we could talk about this all day. Okay. So well, now that I know we will, we will will do that. We're going to do, we're going to start a genealogy podcast. (laughs) Seriously though. That would be so fun, especially to like kind of dive in about like Fort Worth's Oh man, that's like interesting. The past here, I have a couple books on um, Fort Worth's past and stuff like that. I think that's awesome. But yeah, I so with that, uh, you know, I kind of feel like artists are so important in that way because we're like, you know, kind of telling this, telling our story, telling the story of now. But then, you know, like we we are the ones who are kind of inscribing the hieroglyphics of of our time. You know, so like. When you look back in the past, you'll be able to see the story of like what was going on I love in that. those crazy times. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's bring it back to, you know, your childhood. So by the time you were, what, like 12, you decided that art was your path, the path that you were meant for. And like, how did this passion manifest itself at the time? Like, did you start tagging art? Did, were you? Yeah. Like, what, what, what were that. you doing? So I was obsessed with uh, graffiti and I loved, um, in fact, I even wrote a paper on this man and then I met him um, years later in, in Miami at Arts Basel. But um, I loved tagging i loved graffiti i just loved what you could do with with the words but then you know growing up in in dc maryland virginia there the dmv is what we like to call it um just seeing you know our artwork out on the trains are out on the walls you know everywhere i loved seeing that that was like that was our art gallery the representation representation and being like yo i just saw that train over there yo who was that oh you know or like knowing who that was or like trying to figure out like who is this person and I just loved that um, because, and looking back on it, I was like, man, that is such a, that is such a, like a city kid thing. Like, you know, cause here, not too many people are into that, but I'm just like, yeah, like graffiti, that was a thing. Um, was it because it was like all around you? It was, or it, it was, was all surprising? around, it was colorful. You never knew, like you would see characters, you would see just, just, I loved seeing the manipulation of words and letters and, and just all these types of creativity, just like, you know, different kind of color schemes. And I don't know, it was just, it was just my favorite thing to see. But then I would get all the graffiti books and and like would see graffiti from around the world and seeing like Germany has some of my favorite graffiti. And I've never even Brazil. thought about graffiti in other countries. Yeah, Brazil has some amazing graffiti. It's amazing. Wow. Like now we have murals and it's a, it's like really popularized, but back then like, you know, you had to hide it, you know, mm. but yeah, but yeah it, it I, was pretty covert. Yeah. I loved, I just loved doing, creating art and, and, um, my sixth grade art teacher, she was the one who kind of discovered that, you know, she was like, you know, we're doing all these still lives and, and she's like, comes to me and she's like, Oh, I think we've got something here. You, do you, uh, you like to draw? You like all this art stuff? And I was like, clearly like you know in my mind like clearly lady (laughs) but you know she was so then you know she kind of had her eye on me and she kept like kind of asking me like why don't you draw this and I would do it in like five minutes and or like I was always like the first one done or the last one there and like really working on my shading and my details and like how to get this crevice and this fold and this you know like whatever it was was well you really really cared to it I I did I was like it had to be just like what I was looking at. And, you know, so anyway, I got, I got into it really, 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 really deeply. And, um, she suggested, she was like, have you ever heard of Duke Ellington school for the arts? And I was like, no. And she was like, you know, we can, we should 
let's talk about that. So then she brought me some pamphlets. She told me all about it. And then she helped me build a portfolio for me to be able to go. And I ended up going to all the auditions and getting in for like a year scholarship for that was my my ninth grade year. Yeah. What was that like there? Duke Ellington was that also changed my life. Like that was definitely a pivotal time in my life where, you know, it was a school that was 100 percent geared towards whatever it whatever was your artistic outlet. And you were really allowed to explore that in every way. You know, you must have been living for that. It was awesome. Even. Even like skipping school from that school like we would still go out and like tag like we were still going out to go do art stuff right you know or uh i remember one of our field trips we took it was just like a class thing we were walking around and we had to we took pieces of paper and we were doing rubbings and drawings like so the the whole thing was that we were going to create this world out of all these patterns and i still remember this to this day but in order to do that we had to capture all of the elements from around us and how are we going to do that so then we all took like crayons and and papers and we were just capturing all these rubbings mm. like we would go on to like like um, pine needles and pine that needles kind of or like the, the, the floor on the metro or like on the side of the bus maybe there was like a vent that had a really cool design mm. or maybe there was like you know like even the cord onto this you know i'd rub you know like Anything that had like a funky design or some kind of pattern, you would just kind of capture that and then you would transfer and use those into this. It was just, it just That's broke so cool. our minds into all these different concepts that you you just wouldn't have thought about. And you were really allowed to kind of come out of that box. And, and I loved, I loved that. And so I did a paper on my favorite graffiti artist who was Ernie Velez at the time and, uh, and uh, and then years later, I ended up getting to meet him at his studio, which I was kind of beside myself with that. I was like, what? I get to see this old New York graffiti artist and see his studio and meet him. And that was really cool. And I told him about the paper and he was like, man, really? And I said, yeah, you were so worth it. Like I used to see you all in the books, like all over the graffiti books. It was it was awesome. But yeah, that school changed my life for sure. And what grade was that? Uh, that was my ninth grade year. Got it. Yeah. So before then, I mean, first of all, it sounds kind of like, were you a rebel? Uh, yeah. You're still a rebel, <laughs> huh? Yeah. Yeah. Skipping school. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So didn't you at some point like work at a hair salon so okay so on your survey you had a question that said what is something that people don't know about you and i i don't know at, at least in this area i don't think that people know that i'm a licensed hairdresser oh my gosh uh -huh. yeah no i didn't know that mm -hmm. yep so i can i have some barber skills and i'm a licensed hairdresser and i did get like my nail i think it kind of comes along with the territory right where you can get your nail tech your cosmetology yeah your cosmetology yeah. stuff so got all that but yes i did go to hair school i did do all that and um yeah that was that was a time that was like my plan b if this art thing didn't work then i would be in the salon and but i grew up in hair salons i love like anytime i walk into a hair salon i just feel at home because i know them so well um so how old were, were you when you first started working at one i think i was like 14 i was yeah. definitely working under the table yeah getting, not getting supposed paid to be under there. the table totally and i just did, remember did being did you look old for your older for your age no i definitely did not no. i definitely did not no and i I, but I was a shampoo girl and I loved it because we would make some really good tips. Yeah. And like those shampoo girls do. Yeah. And I worked at the Pentagon and like they had hair salons there. And so I would um, do shampoo and uh, yeah, we were making pretty good money. Dang. Really so good. speaking so of making good then. money, <laughs> didn't, didn't you take out a small cash loan from your father and and t tell us about this. Ooh, about, you did. You were doing some digging. Yes, Ooh, I sure did. Yes. So okay, <laughs> that goes to show you how what an entrepreneur I was, right? Early on, and I kind of like this origin story. Maybe maybe I need to talk about this more because I I really don't. But uh, so yeah, so back in school, and I still know some of the people from that school because they still have at least one of them still has some of the artwork that I did for them, but. 
uh, I took out a loan for my dad because he was not about just giving you allowance like that. And allowance was not a thing in our in my household, right? Mm-hmm. So you had to like earn, earn it, it and you and were a going to work. Or right, something. right. Yeah. And so, you know, and chores, that was not like a thing either. Like that was your responsibility. Mm-hmm. You ha- you like, if you live here, you are supposed to do these things. So yeah, we were the same. We, yeah. we didn't get allowances. Right. I mean, I had to clean the whole house. I didn't get paid right. anything. Yeah. It was there like, was you'd have to that. clean the house to be like, okay, can I go see a movie with right. my friend? Sure. <laughs> right. So, so anyway, my dad wasn't just going to give me money. And uh, so he, he said, well, you know, let's, let's do this. I'll give you a loan. You have to give me this back. I said, okay. Uh, so we went over to Costco and we bought two boxes of candy bars. And I went to school and I sold all those candy bars until I could make enough money to buy paint. And then, and that's where I started my little business of like painting on, um, you know, Chuck Taylors or the backs of jean pockets or jean jackets, hats. Like I would do, you know, like Tweety Bird on your jean jacket. Like back in the day when that was wow. like really popular, I was doing all, like I was that guy that like did that for you. So I was doing like Tasmanian Devil and like all this really cool stuff for like graffiti letters or bubble letters or doing your name like that. Um, and then I would also trade for like homework because like I was so not the homework kid either. Like I did, <laughs> I hated homework. It made no sense that I was going to go home and do homework. Like if I'm in school, let me do schoolwork. I don't want to do homework. So anyway, so I didn't, but I, I, I traded a lot for that. <laughs> uh, and you see how that worked out for me. Now I have my, have had my own business for so many years. Um, but yeah, I, did I was always like hustling something? I was always so selling you're selling something. all this from your locker. Totally, totally from Dang. my locker. Yep, I was selling. Um, I remember I would sell like all day bus passes because I knew like a bus driver and he would just give me like the the book of them. He's like, here, I'm about to get off my shift, and he would totally give me a book of the day. Dang. bus passes because we all use public transportation to get to school and those were like two dollars each yeah so i'd sell them for like a dollar fifty and like here you go have your full day pass and you can take the bus all day but that was my jam like that was my hustle i sold that candy and my jean jackets and like custom little pieces for people and yeah <laughs> it's just so cool because it's like back then you didn't even know what market research was probably, Mm-mm. but but really in your <laughs> mind, you were like, okay, I know people need and want these things. Right. I know they want so, fruit roll-ups. So I'm going to give it to them. <laughs> All right. I know they want fruit roll-ups. They want something that they can't like chew out loud, but they can like keep on the roof of their mouth and be quiet and still have candy. Right. Or like yeah. some kind of thing. But then also we all wanted to look fly in school. So well, I just I love that <laughs> that you used to paint on jean jackets. And I still stuff like do. That. Which one am I wearing right now? Ooh, I like that. Oh, my jean jacket. Ha- what does it have in it? Oh, is, is it a panther one or what? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So this jean jacket has a panther on the back of it. Oh, I love that. Mm-hmm. And I still do custom all of my clothes. Like all of my clothes have to be branded now. I feel like I just wear Bruja Market everything or. It either says Bruja Market on it or it says Choke on it or it has a panther on it because I love panthers. You're all about that merch. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you have to. So, all right. So, you had the teacher who recognized your talents. Mm -hmm. You did the portfolio. You went to the school, stayed for a year. And then what happened? Well, that school was really expensive at that time. Um, So, I only could, like, my parents could only afford to keep me there for, like, a year. And then I went back to my original school, um, which was T.C. Williams. Um, if you've seen the movie, Remember the Titans, that was the oh, school. yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely that was the school that I went to. It was massive. Um, I think we had something like 8,000 kids in that school. Oh, my or something. gosh, like it was ridiculous. It had its own zip code that I remember. Whoa, yeah, it had its own zip code, and I remember like thinking about it now i'm like how did we even get an education like it was ridiculous like it's like a factory farm one teacher per like 42 kids like 36 Dang. to 42 kids is is ridiculous yeah <laughs> i was definitely not helping the situation either because i was such a rebel so did you feel 
I mean, did you feel out of place leaving the art school and returning back to, yeah, to your old school? I did. I felt really out of place to the point where I ended up leaving school super early. Like I, I got my GED quick, fast and was like out of here. I did. I had zero interest. Plus I was working. So like I couldn't relate to the kids because mm. I was already, I had a job and like I just did not, I just was not into it. And it's not because I'm dumb. It's not because I'm not smart. It's just, I, looking back now, I probably just wasn't challenged in the right way. And the teachers really weren't equipped to like understand that everyone learns in different ways. Like I was the kid that would doodle on my, on my homework mm. or I would doodle on the tests. And like, I remember my SATs, instead of filling out those bubbles, mm -hmm. I just did a really cool design with the bubbles. So oh, like wow. I made like this awesome, really intricate pattern with it instead. And I turned that in and the teacher was like, you know, if you wanted to just waste that, like you should have, you should have just let me know before you were going to waste that whole test sheet. And I was like, yeah, but this is history now. So <laughs> dang, I wish I would have kept it, but yeah, she yeah. was mad at me. I mean, and if we would add cell phones, you would take a picture of that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Shared right. in your story. I mean, I think I did have a cell phone then, but it wasn't like you could yeah, take was, pictures with it. No, it was probably yeah. a Nokia. Like, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah it, was. it was like you could take phone calls or or play um, snake. snake. That's right. Snake. Yes, that, that exactly. was it. Yep. <laughs> Man, I miss those days. <laughs> right. Sometimes life was simple. Okay, so you earn your G uh, your GED. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it, my good enough diploma. Is that's like right. It. Mm -hmm. it'll, it'll do the job. Mm -hmm. It's done the job. <laughs> okay, so at this time. You dove into your new identity yeah. of CHOKE, an acronym for creating your own kinetic energy. So yeah. how has this persona influenced who you are as an artist and also as a person? I really love names and I love the meanings of names. And, you know, I think for so long people were like, choke what are you choking on what why why choke what what's this and like turned it into these weird things that i was just like this is not no so this is not what that means this is not you know people were kind of assuming what the name meant so it kind of evolved into this acronym which stands for creating her own kinetic energy but is also kind of like a mantra for for myself to you know if i'm here i'm an only child so you know i also I always have to kind of go in my mind and like talk to myself and say, you know, like if, if I'm not feeling up to the task today, I have to create my own kinetic energy to keep moving, to keep going and to just keep rolling with it. You know, even if I don't feel like doing something today or, wow. or that, you know, so just, just kind of having that in my mind all the time to just keep going and keep keep rolling with it. You know, it kind of, it snowballs. It's like, it's like constant momentum, mm -hmm. even yeah. if it's a little bit, Every day, right. it's something. It's something. It's consistency, right? So for you, it's like always moving forward. Mm -hmm. yeah. So do people know your real name? Not I mean, so many. Is, is, that, so is many. that out there in the world? Probably, Could but I don't Google know. Google it and find it? I don't know. I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so. Wow. Yeah, I don't think they can. You're so mysterious. <laughs> I don't try to be. I just, you know, like, I feel like on social media, we live our lives so transparently on there that like i just feel like not everything is yeah but transparent always, you know, like and also artificial right that <laughs> you know it's like some things you just want to keep to yourself yeah. or just like i just wanted to keep something for myself because you know we i come from a generation where like we have one foot in like before internet and then a lot of foot in all the internet you mm -hmm. know so I just feel like I don't always need to have, you know, people recognize me. Like if I cover my, like my mouth, people are like, oh, is that, you? that that's joke, you know, and I'm fine with that, you know, but also too, I think it's part of it is part of it, part of it evolved from me doing graffiti where you cover your face and you don't breathe in the chemicals. And then part of it is um, just, yeah, just kind of maintaining that anonymity. Mm -hmm. And also that just kind of letting the, the art. Yeah, just focus on the art and not so much as who did it because, you know, like we're trying to tell a story. Because sometimes people want to just create this whole thing about who the artist is, but just focus on the artwork. Enjoy that, you know. So is that almost like minimizing the ego when it comes to that? I guess, I guess like 
I guess. Instead Maybe of I just like, didn't even it's think all about, about me. That. Yeah, I, I guess like, I didn't even think like, about no, that. You're like, no, it's about the art. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess I didn't even think about that. But yeah, in a way, I, I, I have no interest in like people really knowing who I am, which I guess doesn't really work for me because people are like, you're, you're not so gonna, mysterious. You're not gonna I want to know, my know name, all about you. Yeah. And you're, and you're not going to see my face. Right. Right. <laughs> well, here's a little bit about that. And I think that, you know, it's not that, you know, I don't, I don't like think I'm any, like any more above or below anyone, but I just, I think that when it comes to my name, I feel like when you're speaking my name or when someone's speaking your name, like, I want that person to know me and to love me. And so like the people who know me and who love me, like my family members and really, really close friends are the ones who are allowed to use my name, mm. right? And so like, I just, I'm like really protective over like who kind of gets into that sphere, I guess. And it's not like, I don't have any traumas around that. I just, I just naturally am like that, I guess. I don't know. Well, Weird. I'm just wondering. I, if no, but it, now you've piqued it, my interest as to like, why Why am I like this? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if, if you have a name like Ursula or Bertha or something. No, like. no, no, no. I, no, I don't. <laughs> just, trying to hide it, just trying to hide it away. No, and I've, I've thought about coming out with like an entire art series with, with my full name. Oh, wow. Uh-huh. And then just like dropping Choke on together and just like coming out as like me. And but I haven't done that yet or that would be that would be something. Right. Yeah. That would be really, really something. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I've given it thought. Have I thought about putting my face on Facebook? Yes. Have I done it? Probably. And then I delete it. But yeah, I just like I don't know. I, it's it doesn't need to be about me. <laughs> oh, I think it's there fun. Yeah. I think it's fun. It I mean, fun. it keeps people. And it's art- yeah, it's like an artistic expression, too. It's like how creative can I be with covering like covering my face or covering now it's just fun i just really enjoyed like you just found a really good picture of me like with this microphone covering my face yeah like, this is perfect this is so a choke picture like i love that. that's right you know just being really creative in that way that is fun and still people know who you are i i do love seeing pictures of you go on vacation with like a big seashell or a drink or <laughs> yeah. you know it's like now it's like right. the, now it's the holidays right you got like a pumpkin or a wreath the big or a tree jingle bell or that i yeah. painted for the tree exactly which was super fun. yeah yeah. Yeah, that was beautiful too. Yeah. I just saw that on Instagram. Yeah. So let's talk about street smart. Okay. <laughs> let's do it. Um, so you were underage in the big city. Oh my goodness. And you would go to nightclubs and jazz lounges in DC, mm-hmm. bring in your camera, pretending to be an event photographer. <laughs> so the bouncers didn't question you. I mean, what what were you going there for? I really wanted to break out of my shell. I'm so, I was such an introvert, but I always wanted to, I just always wanted to get into these spaces where, you know, like there was hip hop going on, there was jazz going on. And I grew up so heavy on jazz. Like my dad always played it. And, you know, it, I mean, it was just part of the city. That was our city is jazz right. and hip hop and like all this music uh, and world music. Um, and I just always wanted to be in there. And for me, the way that I could be in there without having to communicate with adults, because I didn't know how to do that either, you know, I was like, what am I going to talk about with these people? Like the weather, like, I don't, I don't watch the news. Like, I don't know what to talk about with adults. So I would, you know, kind of be like, I'm with the band and have my camera and my, um, you know, my, or my canvas. And I would just show up and be like, let me in. And they would. They just wouldn't even question. I'd be like, I'm here with the band and I've got my camera and all my stuff. And I would just have stuff with me. Like, you know, it's kind of like a walk in like you own the place type of deal. Yeah. Well, you, Act like you know what you're doing. You had to have all your in. equipment with yeah, you. Yeah. You were working. So like why like why wouldn't they let me in? So you were yeah. just going for the experience. Yeah, totally. Just, just to be a part of it. Totally. To immerse to yourself in that culture. Mm-hmm. To learn. Just to be in there. I wanted I was so curious. I just wanted to know what was going on inside of these places. So did you go by yourself? Did you go with friends? Yeah. I went I went by myself. I did a lot like, of things. How by old myself. were you? I would say like 16, 17, 18, Dang. you know? Yeah. Just and did you there. feel safe? Yeah, I felt safe. Yeah. Yeah. I love, I love being out in the city. Loved it. It's why, it's why I feel comfortable traveling alone to foreign countries, like alone. I don't, I, I don't feel, 
Like, I feel like if you could survive out here in the streets of any kind of city in America, you're fine everywhere else. Yeah, because exactly. Because you just kind of naturally have these all eyes around you. You're always watching and you, you know. You well, and you have that. a lot of trust in yourself too. For sure. Yeah. 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 And, and confidence. Right. Right. And, you know, that's, that's one of my things. So, you know, when the pandemic happened, I had to quit this program, but I still do would, I would still like to continue it. But, um, so every year I find uh, a woman artist of color and we will, I will take them with me around the world somewhere. And, but like, I, I love to choose um, artists and especially women artists who have not left the country before. Mm. And that way we can like really bond and maybe they don't know some street smarts. Maybe they need to learn, but they have, but or maybe they've been intimidated to travel around because they, they aren't sure or they aren't sure of themselves. So it's kind of like a learning, like you're learning how to trust yourself and you're learning kind of these street smarts and how to take care of yourself out in the world. And it's something that comes naturally to me. And I guess I don't really think about it, but you know, once you start traveling with someone and you see that maybe there's something they're missing, you're like, oh, wait, put your wallet away. Like, we don't do that. We mm -hmm. don't like, pull out all our money, you know, or things like that. So. Oh, that's so cool. It's, you know, I think it's the same thing with, with New York City. Mm -hmm. Is it's like taking somebody to New York City for their first time mm -hmm. when you've been there a few times and right. can like bring them to do all the, you know, iconic things, yeah. but then like the hidden things. Yeah. And it's just. I love seeing. They'll always remember that. I love living, reliving like the newness of a place through someone else. Mm. I absolutely enjoy that. Like when traveling with someone who's not been to a place that maybe I have, it's really cool to just kind of see like the their awe. face. Yeah. yeah. Because it brings you to this. And that's one thing that I really love about traveling is that it humbles you to a point where, you know, it kind of brings you back to this childlike state. Like you feel like I you feel like a baby. You don't know the language. You don't know where you are. You don't know what's happening. And you just kind of have to roll with it and trust that you're going to be okay, you know, and that you'll make it out there. And, and you will, you know. I, lo I love that feeling of just being like, I don't know, insignificant, I guess. <laughs> it's like, like this world is so massive. Who am I in this world, you know? Just this little person who likes artwork and I like to travel and see other artwork. And so traveling has really inspired your art, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And getting Most to definitely. know other people's cultures. Most definitely. It. I mean, I feel like if you are a citizen of this United States, like I feel like it is, it should be mandatory that we travel. Because how else are you going to understand your neighbors? How else are you going to understand other cultures? Like, I think, I feel like that should be a requirement. You know, like when you get out of high school, you go travel for like a year or two take that gap year or two and really get out there and travel because when you come back you have a, a very good understanding of like where we are in the world and who we are and who you are but also who other people are and they like not everyone has to live this one particular way right and and there's commonalities there's so and, and mm -hmm. excuse me and differences yeah there's so many cool things that you might pick up along the way and and you're like oh i didn't realize this is the way some folks do this over here or do that over here, you know, like, like plus, to this plus day. Plus the food. Yeah. Right? Plus yeah. The I mean, food. yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. And the no, art. Kidding. Yeah. Food and art. Number one. So do you go to museums in other places you travel? I go to museums. Or are you more I into like to, grassroots I art? Go, I do go to museums. No, I try to do the museum thing. Um, now I went the extra step. Like the first time I went to Japan, I love Yayoi Kusama. She's like one of my favorite artists. And I not only went to an exhibit of hers at the museum in Tokyo, but I also made the trip to her hometown. Wow. In Matsumoto. So I went up there. I took the, we took the bullet train and um, it's just, is I think it's like, is it near Nagano? I think it's near Nagano. So we, we took the train, it was my cousin and I, and uh, we took the train up there and then we we stayed for a few days in her hometown and it was that was cool. And I applied what I learned in my school from back in the day and I took some rubbings of like the sewer systems there because the sewer covers, each one was different. Oh, each interesting. One, it was so cool. Like each sewer covering in Every city and every township there in Japan is completely different. Oh, interesting. So it was almost like 
if I was into that, I would be collecting them. And I kind of did. I think I, I remember taking pictures of a lot of them anyway, because I thought that that was so cool. It's like each city has its own little style. But Japan is very much like that. Like if you get on the train, no matter what, it has its own jingle. Every stop, every train stop has its own jingle. It has its own color. It has its own sound. It has its own character, like the, like little anime character. So, you know, you won't forget where you're at. You know. Oh, I, I love that, was, that. Yeah, I thought that was really cool. So didn't you... So I it, fully immerse. I love that. Yeah. So at some point, you moved to the Bay Area and lived in an artist warehouse, which I have to tell you, my husband's from the Bay Area. Oh, yeah? Yeah, oh, okay. he's from Half Moon Bay. All right, yeah. yeah. Half Moon's awesome. So tell us... Did he surf? Um, yeah, I think he did. Or did he just no surfers? Because that... Like, I feel like if you're from there, you 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 kind of need to be a surfer. <laughs> yeah, I think he surfed, but I think he was more into um, dirt bikes. Oh, dirt bike yeah, racing. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I guess that was Sick. a thing. Those extreme he, sports he, over there are he's awesome. He's eight years older than me, too. Mm -hmm. So, like, he was, you know, I think we're, like, the hot male generation. Yeah. He's way before that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, tell us more about this unique experience. So, I kind of feel like I feel like that warehouse space, which if if they're listening and if they ever listen, y'all know who you are. I love y'all so much and I miss all of you. Um that I mean, essentially, I mean, that changed my life too. You know, living in a warehouse filled with other artists. Uh I feel like that was the college experience that I didn't have. You know, where that I was camaraderie, to, yeah, where I was able to learn how to like cohabitate with other people and everyone has their own personalities and how to respect that. And then, you know, just kind of really immersing. But then that there are so they were so dedicated to their craft that I mean, I don't I don't even I don't even really know how to explain it, but um we all definitely kept each other alive in there mm -hmm. because there would be some times when I would disappear into my studio space for like weeks at a time, but I would get knocks on the door every once in a while and be like, Hey, did you eat? Do you want a plate? Here's a plate here. Drink this smoothie or here's a salad I made. And like, we would all check on each other in that way and just kind of be like, Hey, lunch is at, you know, two o'clock. If anybody wants to come out, I made extra. So that know. sense of community. Yes. Uh, community, family, and just, yeah, just really taking care of each other was, it was important. Now, now we, did, didn't you end up spending time in the countryside with, um, like, indig indigenous people from Asia? And, yeah, And getting I immersed did. in that culture, Man, too? that was, that was awesome. That was a whole thing <laughs> in itself. Um, man, so when I moved from the Bay, uh, I left and went out to Thailand and um, and Japan and, uh, and then up to Myanmar and Laos and and all over Asia. But you know, you just kind of get to know people. And I was naturally gravitated towards artists and um, met this girl who was like, uh, she was an artist. And I said, hey, you know, like I really love this this type of style that you have going on here. And then like one thing led to another and she's like, you know, my parents are still like fully in the village. And I was like, what? And in my mind, I'm like, I gotta meet these people. Like I have to know. And so uh, one, th one thing led to another and I was able to go and kind of meet them and, and spend time there. And, you know, like everyone has their job in the village. So like when you get there, you're just like, you have to cook something or you're like chopping up something or you're contributing to the space. Um, and that was really beautiful, but it was also really beautiful to see like, you know, they're making their own threads out of, you know, like maybe the alpacas or whatever animals they have there. And then they're dyeing that with like plant matter and, you know, like you get to really see like shoes being made or clothing being made from scratch and like they like have handmade, their, not made. Right. Yeah. Like they have their looms and they're making everything from scratch and that it just, yeah, I, I love that. But again, me being an artist, really diving into my own genetics and my own lineage, it's, I feel like it is so important to carry on those traditions. Like you're into genealogy and like, and you worked with the elderly to tell their stories, that's like me with this is I want these artists and these artisans and these makers to tell their stories because that is an ancient, these are ancient 
traditions mm-hmm. that have been passed down and passed down and passed down. And it's to me, it is like, again, it's just so important to tell the history of our planet right. through these crafts and how they still live on to this day. I mean, yes, things are mass made and, you know, we lose a lot of that sense of tradition and quality uh, because of this fast fashion and fast, you know, production. But when you do find them uh, who are small batch and, you know, why I so love like Fort Worth's, you know, tight knit, small business community, because we are like small, but mighty, but then also like the quality of the things that we're making is like really, really good. Right. You know? And uh, yeah. So anyway, I, I felt like it was really important to kind of, you know, highlight their traditional things and it's kind of what has evolved into what Bruja Market is, is kind of preserving those cultures by sharing them and telling their stories and just kind of, you know, diving in. But coronavirus. (laughs) Yeah. So tell us more about that. Um, About what? About opening up your first retail spot, Bruja Market. So, yeah. So that was in the collective, right? Yeah. uh, So this this small, the micro shop started at uh, the 76107 Collective. And um, I, as soon as the pandemic hit, like, you know, like so many of us, there was really no point to paying rent to somewhere that we couldn't really go and open the doors or be in. So I ended up shutting that down. I mean, it was such a cool experience. And I really think that, um, you know, it probably could have snowballed and grown, but I think too, like there was some pivots that needed to happen and just needed to kind of shift gears. And, and I just feel like the space itself for me wasn't as big as I needed it to be because there's so much more there's so many more things that I wanted to share and that I I do share um so these pop-up markets are definitely like the thing for me right now until I can find like a solid retail space which I'm actively looking for if anyone's listening um yeah I'm actively looking for a space um, well and and it's low risk right I mean the pop-ups yeah yeah totally I mean you pay your rent for the day right and then and then you show up you do your thing and then you roll out and there is no there is no risk because you're you know I mean I guess yeah minimal risk because if I don't make my make anything else I need to make my table what was it what was it like having the the micro shop in a shared space with with other shops uh it was really fun I loved it we would always kind of sit down and um kind of brainstorm like how can we bring others in and how can we improve this like what do we want this to morph it was still so new like we 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 really it was it was cut short and i think that it could have grown into some things but but it was you know the timing was just all off so you know for the virus to kind of shut everything down but at some point, I love collective spaces. And I because of my experience in living in an artist warehouse space, I know that it can work. It's just having that right group of people. To right. Like, you know, because once you get the right people, you're good. Yeah. And it can be a really beautiful thing. Yeah. I think the collective action model is, is really effective, mm-hmm. but you've got to have like the right backbone person right. too. That's For also sure. important. Yeah. Yeah. To kind of hold it together. Yeah. The, the girl that was kind of our backbone at the, at the warehouse, like she was, she was awesome. Oh. Natural leader. Like she's, she was really, really cool. Um, at the warehouse in Oakland. Awesome. Yeah. So what kind of lessons have you learned from opening up your first shop? Oh, well, so many things, right? Um, Give us a good one. Let's see. <laughs> like, what did I write down? Did I write anything down? Do I have any of these lessons? Um, I would say definitely do your research. Make sure you know the area. Make sure you know what your, what your general community needs and wants. But also having a product that or service that um, is relatable and that that you are very passionate about. Like if you're not passionate about it, you don't know anything about what you're Because t- I do know business owners who do not know anything about what they're selling and they just sell it because it makes money. And mm. to me, I just, it's, that's too sterile. I don't, I don't want to buy anything from anyone that, that they don't know clearly what they're selling and what they're doing with it. Um, it just means so much more, you know, to have someone know what they're doing. Well, yeah. everything that you sell, I mean, it really is, at least my perception, 
it's really an extension of yourself. Yeah. I mean, the candles, the, mm-hmm. I mean, and really the more that I learned about your story, which is why I'm so excited that you're here sharing it yeah, with our listeners you. is, you know, there's a reason why you have Prince or, right. you know, all, yeah. all of these different people. It's, these are the people who have been a part of, of your journey. Yeah. Yeah. In- inspiration for sure. I mean, so my shop has evolved out of, sheer survival but then also like this is my lifestyle being an artist in america means that you don't have health insurance you don't have health care you don't have any kind of help in that way um i mean unless you're like you've really really made it and you can afford to do that but most of us cannot uh so yeah so it's turned into me having to look towards herbs and natural living and natural lifestyle to be able to take care of myself properly and to be able to eat properly you know let's do some alternative uh healthcare practices let's do some meditation which shouldn't be considered fringe or alternative i think that should be primary but you know, maybe one day we'll get there, which I think we are, because there's a lot of people waking up to that. But so that's what inspired your direction. It is the fact that you're an artist without healthcare. Yeah, I did not yeah. know that. Yeah, I mean, I knew My you were really direction. into like tinctures mm-hmm. and you know all of these kinds of things. Yeah, me Apothecary having to carry business. Yeah. The fact that I have been living this lifestyle for a long time. You know, I. I don't just like put things out there because it's like the cool thing to do. No, I'm doing, I'm putting certain teas out there or certain products out there because I actually use them every day in my life. And I live this lifestyle. Like I, I can't not, you know, use these things in my everyday. And that's what keeps you well. Right. And so, because it's worked for me, I know that it would work for other people. So here we go. Let's, how can now, you know, uh, in order to be able to pay my bills and to survive, I'm now monetizing something that I'm extremely passionate about, but also is something that's keeping me alive because I'm able to keep my health in check with the things that I'm using. So and that I know feeds it works for me. further back into why you're passionate about it. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. Because I'm always looking at like, you know, what about this herb? What about that herb? you know, what does this do? Like, I love to see that each plant has its own thing or, you know, it's its own benefit. And then if you mix these two plants, now they have this combined benefit. Um, I love, I love that. And I love wellness. I just love healing. You know, we, the world needs so much healing. And if you've lived through the pandemic, we all need it. We all need health. You know, we all need, um, you know, healing and, and, um, in every way. So, yeah, and self care. Yep. So when you closed down the micro shop, you moved everything out of your house and started operating out of there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I had, I had the storage unit, and I had the shop with you know like all my inventory in the storage unit, and then I, <laughs> and then I moved everything into the apartment. It was so tiny. We had a small, small apartment, and that just was not going to work. Like it could only go go on for how, so long. How did you do it? I mean, was your dining room table full of uh, yeah. candles and purses? Yes, yes. Every, it was. Just Were you just like with drowning and, in, yes. in your stuff? Totally. Like we did not have any space for like anything. Like there was no. It was like okay, I'm gonna sit on my computer. I'm gonna create this little space that I can work from, and then have inventory just all around and. You know, I was online selling my stuff and just and you were working on a new website and, and yeah, totally re- really pushing the online sales mm-hmm. for selling retail. Yeah. Did that just feel like overwhelming at being, first, being surrounded by all the things? Yeah, at first it was, and then finally, like I really started getting a system down. So like, you know, had to get different shelving and start, you know, I had organizing a, it. Yeah, an, an organized method. I mean, I'm pretty organized anyway. So it was like there was a lot of stuff, but it was organized. Um, but it still was like really daunting because when I want to go to sleep, I want to go to sleep in a peaceful place right. but you know i mean you know we all start somewhere and that's how you know that's just how it went right like, we've all taken a trip totally, down to order town right <laughs> <laughs> i know right like having a retail store oh my gosh that is such a trip for me because when i travel like generally my lifestyle is really minimal but 
but I have a freaking retail store, which means you have to have product and you have to have stuff. inventory. Oh yeah. my gosh. Who knew? If I would have known that, <laughs> I would probably rethink this thing. But uh, but it's fun. Otherwise, I love I love sharing things. I love finding unique things from from around the world. I love meeting new artists and I love supporting their their crafts. So you're a part of the ever growing muralist community. How have you developed friendships with fellow muralists? How through speaking up <laughs> through speaking up about how we don't get paid properly? Let's hear it. That's how I've been, and, uh, and I have heard that. From others as well. Yeah. 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 Especially when there's like a contest or a bid, you know, for $5,000 or a thousand. And it's like, you know, I don't, I I don't even subscribe. I just don't even, I don't even do that. But I've made friends with people in the muralist community uh, because, because I am one, but also um, because it is important for us to get to know each other. And to kind of talk about like where we're at with things and what's fair, what's not fair. And we all have like different ideas of, you know, what we want to see on walls. But um, but I mean, it's a job. Right. And we all want to know, like, what is a competitive rate? What is a rate? What is a good amount that we should be at least minimally being paid? Um, because I feel like sometimes cities and this is not Fort Worth is not alone in this but I think that some cities feel like or or people can feel like they're entitled to our work for free but it we all have bills and with rents looking like the way that they are we need to pay we need to pay our rent and artwork coming from a blank canvas to a full on art piece out of our brains requires payment you yeah know? so but outside of that um, well, because I think you, the way that you and I met is because we both have a good mutual friend yeah. who offices out of my headquarters yeah. and, um, you know, she, she echoed the exact same thing yeah. is she gets kind of annoyed when she sees, you know, especially with a multi-million dollar organization mm -hmm. saying, oh, we're doing a, we're looking for muralists that will pay a thousand dollars for something that's going to take a month long yeah. work, you know? And it's right. just like- When my rent is not that, yeah. my groceries are not that, like my living expenses is not that. And I do, could have other work to do uh, that would pay, pay the bills. So yeah, I don't know. Um, so I, I really don't even have very many murals here. Oh like, no, I, I don't, because I I won't. <laughs> yeah, I won't unless I get paid properly, and it's just my own personal thing. Like there are artists who are down to do murals for free, and I just don't. I don't do that after after being an artist for as many years as I have been over fifteen. I don't do free artwork anymore. Good for you. You know, and so if that means that I don't get a mural, then I don't get a mural. I will have my shop and I will have my methods of making money, even if that mural is not one of them. Right. Yes, I have things to say with my artwork, but it can wait, you know, or I can get it down on canvas whenever I have the time to be able to, to do that. But, uh, but also too, uh, another way that I've been making friends and, and just kind of, introducing myself to people in the community is the fact that, that, you know, and this is not ego. It's just that I do have experience out here. I have lived in a lot of cities. I've lived in a lot of places and have immersed myself as a street artist, as an artist and an, and as an artist who has been in the streets and who has lived in the streets. Um, you know, I offer a perspective that not everyone has, you know, when you've had nothing, and you've had to really come from that or like having experienced that nothingness, you will learn everything you need to learn along the way. And, you know, sometimes I feel like either I'm being taken for granted or I'm just not heard when I say that I have this experience or this is why people need to get paid for this experience. Like this is not a hobby of mine. This is not something I just like to do. This is something that I have to do uh, you know, I have to get it out. I am an artist. Like I, I am fully committed to creating and being a creator and a creative person. But in order to do that, you know, we need to be respected and we need to get paid what our worth, you know? So. Absolutely. I love that. So how important is perseverance 
for you as an artist and an entrepreneur? Because it's not easy, right? Uh, uh, yeah, no, I don't recommend it. <laughs> I don't recommend for, I don't recommend this lifestyle for everyone. Uh, it's not easy. And if you if you don't like being told no, then don't do it. <laughs> like Because you're going to be shut out. You're going to be told no. You're going to be refused. You're going to some people are just not going to respond back to your, you know, your invoice, you know, or your whatever, um, your requests. Um, so, but yeah, perseverance and consistency is key. You have to keep going. You have to, if you really want this, you will need to keep going because there is going to be a lot of denial of your artwork and there's going to be a lot of rejection and a lot of people can't handle that, you know, and it is what it is. Didn't you have a situation not too long ago where you're trying to go after a space and uh, the landlord got kind of weird because she Googled your business name and, and didn't like what that, what I don't that know. meant? I don't know. I, I don't know what's going on with that whole thing. I, I just mean like, are, that... do you ever feel misunderstood oh, yeah. you know, by what you're trying to do? Like maybe um, the typical person who's the landlord doesn't understand you and, and yeah. what you're trying to do. Yeah. I think that, yeah, you definitely need to get to understand and know. Right. Um, but it's also why it chose the name, like the name Bruja Market is not, um, it's not what you think it is. Right. So when we're here in the Bible Belt, particularly, which is why I love the name that I chose because I'm here in the Bible Belt, it, I thought it was really, really important for me to help demystify and, you know, decolonize the way that, you know, that word is being thrown around and, um, well, I don't even know what it means. Demon, demonized. Uh, so Bruja, Bruja in Spanish or translated into English is witch. Oh, okay. Right. And, um, I just feel like there is a lot of, um, just kind of negative connotation with, with those words or with that word. And, um, you know, when you travel around the world, like we were just talking about when, when there's, you know, tribes members who are making their own fabrics and they're making their, they're dyeing their fabrics with plants and, and dyes that they've made from, you know, stones or whatever, inks, dyes, whatever. Um, and then they're, they're tilling the land and they're farming and they're growing their own foods and they're taking care of the animals and they're planting these herbs and trees and these plants based on what's happening with the stars, because that's how, you know, ancient traditions did it. You right. know, that's how everyone around the world works. There's a particular time when you're supposed to plant things. Um, that in a lot of times is, is demonized and called witchcraft or, you know, it's called brujeria. And I think that everywhere you go around the world, there is going to be people who are practicing their own ancient traditions. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that it's right to demonize that at all. You, And it's demonized because it's not understood or it's been, you know, folks are trying to colonize it and, and make it something that, that it doesn't need to be, you know. We we need to remember who we are. We need to understand where we come from. We need to understand. We need to honor our planet and we need to honor all those traditional ways that we had because they did honor the planet. They did honor the sun, the moon, the stars. So I feel it's important for me to have this particular name. But, you know, I'm also about the education about it. So, you know, if you don't ask me, then you won't know. People can assume all they want to assume, but you have to get to know it. You have to ask about it. I mean, at least I would, you know, if there was somebody that had a business that I was like, oh, what's this name all about? Like, I want to know all about that. But yeah. that's just me because I want to know all about everything that I do anyway, which I do because I'm very curious. Yeah. And I mean, you really are the epitome of a perpetual learner. Yeah. I mean, you're constantly. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting, right? Like I left school super early, but I, I love learning just, I didn't like learning the shit we were, oh, I didn't like learning the stuff that we were learning in school. Oh, you can say shit on oh. here. <laughs> didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just didn't like the stuff that we were learning in school. Mm -hmm. It just didn't, to me, it didn't make sense. There was a lot of like, no, the natives did not give you this land. Mm -hmm. You know, I knew that was false. Deep down, I knew it was false. That th there was like so many things that we were learning in school that just didn't make sense. And we didn't well, learn. that's because of the authors of the book. Right, that too. But then also, like, we didn't learn how to, like, balance checkbooks and, like, 
change a tire. Yeah, we didn't learn those things. So how to change your own oil. I'm glad I do left. Do your taxes. Oh, yeah. I know. I'm glad I left. I'm, I'm like, there was well, why did we learn about, yeah, Egyptian so pyramids? <laughs> right. I mean, that's kind of important. But yeah, no, like, I mean, I, it, like, like there's a lot of things that I, I just, I don't understand why, why they were pushing that. But, you know, the things that I'm out here learning is I'm glad that I'm able to pick and choose what I'm learning now. Like, that's my college. You know, and if I were a- ever able to go to college, I would love the opportunity to do that now because I would pick, I would be able to pick and choose exactly what I wanted to learn. And right now, right now, I think it would be something that I've been wanting to conquer is math. Ooh. Like, you know, like. No, I don't. <laughs> because I don't know that language. That is a really tough language. Math is hard. Math is really yeah. hard. But I would love to dive in on I that I think one. the most difficult class I ever took in college was statistics. I mean, I push it off to last. <laughs> and, I, and you know what? I got a C minus. And that was like. I was joyous. Yeah. That was like the best C minus. I yeah. It was the only C minus I'd ever gotten. Right. But it was the best one because I was like, I don't think I'm going to pass this thing. Yeah. It's hard. I mean, I love numbers. I love, I love numbers. I love the patterns that you can create with numbers and the geometry that you can create with numbers. But like, you know, th- these like full language, it's a language, it's a language that it really I, I just really, I would love. And it's universal. So it's, it's, it would apply everywhere. And, th- and they're I complex processes. Mm-hmm. I think it was like, you know, the fact that with statistics, you have to go through like eight different <laughs> parts of a process to get your answer. Right. right? It's like, Okay, it feels like we should have found an easier way. Right, right. Now, right. now I don't it know is, what by, this... by using your calculator. Right. Now I don't know what this new math is, this yeah, common real. core or whatever is going on out here. I'm glad I don't have kids so I don't have to deal with that. But yeah. that, I don't understand what that is. But yeah, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> so you started the Woke Book Club, uh-huh. uh, which is dedicated to expanding and deepening community understanding of social justice issues. And don't you have like hundreds of people in it? Yeah, that was weird. That was like all of a sudden. Like how had... did this come to be? So it started with like 12 of us when we were reading. Um, so it started uh, because I just really wanted to make sure that um, we were able to have these conversations in the community Um after me learning about how conservative this particular area is, I was like, you know, but we do need to talk about some things. And I'm understanding that there are people who maybe even are conservative, but who are actually and they curious learn. and they yeah. and they do want to learn and they, they are willing to read the books and we can have these conversations. Now, this book club was just about, you know, just being consciously aware. Right. Just being consciously aware of the things that are in our communities, mm-hmm. in and around the communities. And, but and also, our privilege, and, right? Yeah. So, you know, and it started with just 12 people at the first meeting, but then it grew into 700 people. And I was like, how did this happen? <laughs> well, I mean, I think some of that, I, I don't remember the timing exactly. Was it after George Floyd? Was no, that... no, our book club was before. Before that, okay. Yeah, way before. So we were but, doing this like a couple of years before the protests happened and before the the, the um the lockdowns but yeah we but it must been have on this mission for a long time after that right for because sure it was like all of a sudden i mean as a white woman it's like you know our privilege and you know what what can we do better i mean right i know yeah, how i am and treat others and all that right. but you know, everybody still has stuff to work on. Everybody has things to learn. Yeah. I, I found it really interesting how many white people were joining because I, I think they felt like it was like the thing to do. But I, I wonder, because I haven't really been on there too much. And, and I feel like the, the book club kind of went into this weird space where I just feel like because of this trend, and I, I say trend because I feel like it was like, people were joining the book club because they just felt like it was like the thing to do. Mm-hmm. And the amount of emotional labor that we had to do within that book club was just so much. And frankly, it wasn't worth our sanity mm-hmm. and it wasn't worth our, the fact that we knew that it, at the end of the day, it might not even change anybody's mm-hmm. minds because we're still seeing the same shit over and over and over again. Yeah. You know, so, you know, that's another thing. 
that was another thing that I also felt like, hey, I'll leave you my cash app for all this emotional labor. That was a lot. That was mm-hmm. a lot of, he- I mean, we were going to therapy. We we had to go to therapy like every week just to talk about, you know, being activists and having this book club and like having to like talk to people and and really have a heavy load and a heavy burden because it was there was some really deep conversations that were happening. Did it kind of get to the point where you were like, look, I am not like here to make you feel better about no uh, about and I, we never were yeah like that's that wasn't what the book club at, at all was like yeah. we were not here to make anyone feel like good about themselves like we were here to be like here, getting educated this is what y'all did yeah this is what this has been going on for this long we need to talk about these issues these are um you know like especially when we read um the color of law that that one's such a such an important book and I still recommend it to this day. If you have not read it, it is dense. Um, there's a lot of big words in there and, but I like to listen to it on audio because, you know, it's kind of read it. The narration is really good on it, but it talks about gerrymandering and redlining and like, mm. you know, when they build highways and they break up neighborhoods and like why they do what they do and how, how segregation in America is still rampant today mm-hmm. and like in, in just building structures and like how, you know, gentrification works and things like that. So it's, it's really, really important. Even now with art. Oh yeah. And I, I sent something to Megan Henderson not that long ago. That was something that I had read. It was about whitewashing mm-hmm. and, and it was all about, you know, these gentrified spaces, artists coming in, having the spaces be a place for the artists, the artists would transform the spaces, then real estate, you know, commercialization would come in, they'd hire other artists to, Mm -hmm. you know, make it cool with the intention of more real estate and a retail coming in to the point where all of the artists would leave because they didn't want to, you know, and I, and I was like, how are we going to make sure that the near South side doesn't turn into the, you know, like it's it's interesting. Mm -hmm. I just thought it was really interesting. Yeah. It takes people to really care about the community, which, which I think that we do have that. It's just absolutely, but I know that it's, it's gotta be really hard because you're up against a lot. Like there's a lot of money that's coming in. So, you know, we just have to be really careful to not, um, I don't know. I, I I can't say like, you know, that we're not being pushed out because we are and we have been. So that is what that is. I'm just fighting against like having to actually leave because I don't want to. And I don't feel like I should be scratching at the bottom of the barrel to be able to to make it in this Fort Worth. Like, I, like right. there's no reason why. The rising housing costs. That's and, right. There's no yeah. reason why an artist like myself or anyone else, any other artist here should be like, in a position where they're not going to be housed, you know, especially if we're supposedly being regarded as high as we are, you know? Yeah. So I'm not, I'm it not is kind of ironic, it, right. You know, you want your murals, then I want my rent paid period. Yeah. <laughs> like if you want to beautify this thing where people are coming to take their selfies and they're, they're, we're making it a destination space and we need to be not in fear of being homeless. So yeah. what's next for you? What is next for me? Uh, I'm still looking for a brick and mortar. Yeah. In I'm here still or looking, Dallas? Yeah, here, here, here. I'm looking here. Yeah. I'm still looking for a brick and mortar around here. I would love to kind of set up shop and do my thing. Um, you know, we need a we need a nice cozy space to just kind of do artsy things. So I'm I'm still looking. I'm looking around and so if anyone's listening and they have a space, let me know. Anything else going on with you? I mean, are you taking any trips you're looking forward um, to? Or yeah, I'm are you looking, gonna see your family for the holidays? Well, my mom's traveling, my dad's traveling. Um, which is funny, someone pointed that out. They were like, Oh yeah, your mom's like in Europe and your dad's down in South America. So I understand now why you travel a lot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so even for the holidays, we are not around. Um Hoping to get down to Florida pretty soon. Um, there's an art collective out there I want to check out. And then um, 
I don't travel home during the winter time because DC is entirely yeah, yeah. too cold for me these days, and I feel like I'm kind of bougie in that way these these days. So I'm just like, mm, when it becomes when it's past October, I, I just don't go. <laughs> I don't go to the East Coast. I'm like, it's too cold. Unless it's I'm going to the, yeah, unless I'm going to Florida or some kind of beach weather, then I, I won't go there. But uh, yeah, hopefully a road trip pretty soon. I would like to go on a road trip with um, with my dog and roll around. Uh, and then and then, yeah, hopefully uh, maybe in January, January, February is usually my my kind of chill time um, in the season. So mm -hmm. Then I well, it seems go. like life slows down. Yeah, all it's the holidays cold, are over. No one wants to chill. do anything. Yeah. yeah, and there's not really any pop ups. There's no markets going on. Not very many. Eating, um, eating soup and reading books. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And that's my jam too. I love me to too. Soup, so. Me too. Yeah, I'm a soup person for sure. Same here. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being our guest. Well, thank you for having me. This was fun. Super fun. <laughs> well, I look forward to seeing your face and hearing your name shortly. <laughs> right? There we go. <laughs> well, thanks again for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Founders Club, where women aren't just building a business, they are building themselves. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Found Hers Club. Or you could visit our website, foundhersclub.com. Send us any questions you have or recommendations for future podcast guests. Even better, you could spread the love by subscribing to the Found Hers Club on iTunes. And if you really love us, leave us a five-star review. This will help other listeners just like you find us. Now go share your magic with the world.